are you ready for software 3.0? Andres Karpathy is a well-known AI researcher that was a founding member of the OpenAI Research Group and worked as Tesla's director of AI, among other things. He is an excellent pedagogue, and I strongly invite you to check out his educational content. He recently gave a talk about the evolution of software as we are hitting the 3.0 paradigm shift democratized by LLMs. He made some insightful points, and today I will give you a condensed version together with my own takes on the subject. Andrej segments software in three different stages, each introducing a significant paradigm shift and characterized by its own artifacts. Software 1.0 is writing raw code and is the longest phase since coding inception from approximately 1940 to 2012. It involves explicitly writing each step required to solve a task in a program that the computer can execute. It requires domain knowledge, as you are encoding human expertise into a program. For instance, writing a sorting algorithm that orders a list of numbers. These paradigm artifacts are collections of source code files. Here, your performance is strongly determined by the quality of your algorithms. Software 2.0 is statistical machine learning dominated by deep neural networks. This paradigm arose from the progress of deep learning that GPU made possible, approximately from 2012 to 2019. Here, you do not explicitly code the recipe to solve a problem. You collect data and let a learning algorithm figure out the best way to achieve your goal. This paradigm is dominated by supervised learning, where each data sample consists of an input and its expected output. There is still code from 1.0, but it's only used to craft the learning algorithm. Your performance is now mostly data-driven, and you typically improve as you feed more data of better quality to the learning program. For instance, AlphaZero became superhuman at Go without any human domain knowledge, but solely through data generated by playing against itself. These paradigm artifacts are neural network weights, the output of the learning algorithm. Software 3.0 are prompts working as programs to control programmable LLMs, approximately since 2019. In this paradigm, you don't have to train the model to achieve a specific task. You can write a program in English, call the prompt and give it as input to an LLM. For example, you can ask an LLM to extract dates from a piece of unstructured text. These paradigm artifacts are natural language prompts. Your performance is now determined by the quality of your prompts and how you craft the LLM context. You can accomplish tasks using any of the three paradigms or a combination of them, each having its own advantages and drawbacks. Each paradigm needs a fluid flow of its artifacts to thrive. It's typically achieved with a popular repository containing artifacts in open access. 1.0 has GitHub, the biggest marketplace of source code files. It makes possible to build projects on the shoulder of giants as you can just clone code and run it or use it to build your own artifacts. 2.0 has Hugging Face, which contains neural network weights from almost all the open source models, trained on different datasets. It lets you use neural networks easily for inference, but also train your own, fine tune based on existing weights, or combine them in more complex neural networks. 3.0 has not yet a widely popular solution for distributing its artifacts. Some protocols like MCP help you access prompts and tools off the shelf and use them with your LLM improving the distribution. But nothing as mature as GitHub or Hugging Face has already emerged. It's interesting to notice how each software stage builds upon its predecessors. We use 1.0 code to describe the critical learning algorithm used to train 2.0 neural network weights. 3.0 uses a training algorithm described with 1.0 code, but also neural network weights from 2.0 to interpret and run the programs represented as natural language prompts. To illustrate how the introduction of a new paradigm starts to replace functionalities from the predecessors, Andrej shares an anecdote from his experience at Tesla, where 2.0 ate up 1.0 code as neural networks increased in capabilities. Lots of glue code and human handcrafted procedures were absorbed by the neural network themselves as they gained in performance. Another example that I find illustrate this pretty well is AI beating humans at Go or chess. Early systems involved a lot of 1.0 code describing complex human crafted rules. 2.0 solutions like Alpha Zero are purely trained from data and their decisions are mostly based on the output of neural networks. 
And to finish this section, I want to share another analogy to fully grasp the difference between 2.0 and 3.0. Software 2.0 can be compared to ASIC, application-specific integrated circuits. For instance, there are ASIC to mine Bitcoin, and even though a general-purpose CPU can do it, the ASIC will be faster and more energy efficient. Software 3.0 is more like a modern CPU. They are general-purpose and programmable, without needing to be recreated for each task. You don't have to rebuild the CPU to build another program. Only the programs, your prompt, change. After discussing the different phases of software, Andres talks about how to think of LLMs. Firstly, he draws a clever analogy between LLMs and utilities such as electricity. Indeed, LLMs need significant capex investment to train, thousands of GPUs and data centers, which is similar to the cost of building the power grid of the electricity network. They also induce OPEX to serve intelligence over an increasingly standardized API, prompts, images, tools, like electricity is served over standardized API, determine voltage, sockets, and so on. You can notice how every LLM provider now has some compatibility with the OpenAI SDK API. Intelligence is consumption build per million of tokens consumed. Similarly, you pay electricity based on the what you used. Also, LLM users expect low latency, high uptime and consistent quality, like we expect consistent voltage and no service interruption for electricity. There are routers like Open Router that routes your request to different LLMs based on predefined rules. You can see them as transfer switches linking the grid, solar battery and generators together. Finally, there are intelligent brownouts when providers go down. Have you noticed how everybody complain they can't code anymore without their LLM assistant? The second comparison in the talk is LLM as fabs, or semiconductor manufacturing plants. Like fabs, they require huge capex and they involve a deep and rapidly growing tech tree with industrial secrets. Have you seen how OpenAI stopped being open and kept their technique as secret as the Coca-Cola recipe? Similar to fabs, the output, the LLM model, is cheap to use comparatively to the crafting costs, as CPUs are crazy expensive to build, but cheap to use. The third analogy is LLM as operating systems. Indeed, they are increasingly complex software ecosystems, not simple commodities like electricity or tap water. LLMs are software, trivial to copy-paste, manipulate, distribute, and steal. They are not physical infrastructure. You can download the weights of an LLM. You remember how the early versions of Llama leaked via torrents and people pirating the weights like you download your favorite movies. Once downloaded, you can modify the weights via fine tuning or you can use them in another model. Also, as operating systems, there is friction to change due to different features, performance, style and capabilities. Try convince a diehard Windows user to install Arch Linux. They also have two different spaces, system and user. You have the system prompt and the user prompts like you have the kernel and the user space in operating systems. You can also run apps on Windows, Mac, Linux, like you can run LLM app such as Cursor on GPT-03, Cloud4, or Gemini 2.5. The next part in the talk is about LLM psychology. LLMs can be defined as stochastic simulations of people and they display an emergent psychology that Andrej calls people spirits. They have a better memory than any individual human, akin to an encyclopedic memory. Even though they are extremely useful, they have many flaws that you need to keep in mind to harness their maximum power. An LLM is a lossy simulation of a savant with cognitive issues. Firstly, they hallucinate in a tricky way as they are pretty convincing spitting out facts that seem plausible while making stuff up. They also have a jagged intelligence where they excel at certain tasks while sucking at basic queries such as finding the number of hours in strawberry. Contrary to a human worker, they have complete amnesia beyond their context size. A human worker will internalize knowledge as it works and build up experience, while an LLM will do so up until reaching the context size and then start from scratch or start forgetting early data. Finally, they also are gullible, making them weak against prompt injection attacks or you can convince the LLM to do stuff it wasn't supposed to do. So LLMs are gullible savants with amnesia and hallucination. It sucks. But remember we also said they were pretty useful in many scenarios. The point is that they are not ready yet 
for full autonomy, contrary to the hype and flashy demos that break down as soon as you throw a real use case to them. So how do you maximize the LM value while avoiding the traps? The hype is all about autonomous agent, but the real value is actually in partial autonomy. GUI are still important to supervise and review agent work. And the more vertical the task, the better output. Task verticality means narrowing down the scope as much as possible to minimize AI errors and maximize your capability to quickly review the work. You can achieve partial autonomy by using multi-level GUI that makes traditional interfaces for human with LLM integrations. Those applications have two important goals. They package the state into a context window before calling an LLM, and they orchestrate different models. For instance, embedding models, chat models, or diff applying models for code. It's usually better to provide an autonomy slider and let the user decide the level of autonomy for a task. For instance, from low autonomy like tab completions in cursor, or editing a file to full agent mode. The ultimate goal for good partial autonomy is to maximize the speed and accuracy of the AI generation and human verification loop. You have to keep the agents on the leash. The second part of the solution is building for agents. Is your application ready for agents? It's an important question to ask as users expect to interact with your products via LLMs more and more. But LLMs suck at navigating complex multi-step UIs. Andres shares an anecdote of vibe coding a local demo of an app compared to deploying the app in production in a VM or cloud service. Vibe coding works well as cursor-like applications are built for LLMs. However, implementing Google Authentication is a pain for the LLMs as it involves navigating UI interfaces with multi-steps instead of simple API calls. So make your products agent-friendly. Some examples of building for agents are LLM.txt files that describe with specific instructions for LLMs how to navigate and make sense of the website without going through the UI interface, usually in Markdown format. Markdown is the best means of communication for LLMs, as it's close to the data we train them on. You also have documentation for LLMs as Markdown instead of HTML pages, so AI can easily learn how to use your tools or products without wasting tokens that describes the UI, like HTML tags. But not only you have to put your documentation in a Markdown file, you also have to adapt the content for the LLM. For instance, instead of using click here as you do in human documentation, you would replace with the curl command that triggers the same action so an agent can do it easily. Finally, you have context builders like git ingest. It's funny because in an earlier video in the channel, I showed how to build a simple script to do the exact same thing, but locally, so with the local git repo, and uh, getting one file that describes all the different files and their content in your code repository. To conclude this video, software went through three phases, raw code, neural network weights, and now prompts. Each has advantages and shortcomings, and the best solution to a complex problem will often be a combination of the three, picking the best paradigm for different tasks and combining the results. To strive, each paradigm needs a fluid flow of its artifacts. For 1.0, we have GitHub. For 2.0, we have Hugging Face. For 3.0, nothing mature yet, but systems like MCP contributes to the flow. We can see LLMs as utility needing CapEx to build, OPEX to serve, with method billing and creating a big dependency from society. They also have Fab's characteristics, such as huge CapEx and deep tech trees with secrets. Finally, they also are like operating systems, as they are software ecosystems that can run applications with their own memory being the context and their own programs being the prompts with access to external devices, such as also LLMs, internet, video, and audio I.O. To maximize the value of LLMs, you have to build partial autonomous applications that maximize the speed and accuracy of the AI generation human verification loop. Full autonomy is not yet here if you expect valuable results and not flashy demos. We also have to bid for LLMs, which means reimagining the way we interact with tools and services to support both human and AI. It usually involves an easy API access beyond GUI and markdown communication. Hope you liked it. See you in the next one.